Welcome to an, another elder care workshop offered at the University of Kentucky by the Work Life Elder Care Office. Today, we're going to be talking about medications and aging. And our speaker today is Dr. Daniela Moga, who is in the College of Pharmacy here at the university. Thank you so much, Dr. Moga, for being with us today. Thank you so much for the, the introduction and thank you for, for being uh, uh, here uh, on a lovely day uh, with lots of sunshine. I appreciate having you uh, all participate in, um, in a, a workshop. We will be talking about medications um, and you will see um, a lot of references that I will be making in, in these presentations are related to my, my work that um, focuses mostly on uh, brain health. So I will make uh, lots of references to uh, things that affect our brains, especially as we age. But um, anything that I'm saying does not only apply to brain health. You can think of it um, as applicable to, to just in general uh, medications and, and aging. And we'll talk about... Um, you know, getting benefits without the risk. So this is another key theme of my presentation is this balance between risks and benefits, which is uh, very important um, when considering medications as we age. Um, before I begin, I want to also mention that I don't have any conflicts of interest related to these uh, medications other than presenting towards the end some of the work that we've done um, here at University of Kentucky. And I will start by asking um, you, know, you to think and reflect. Uh, so it's not necessarily something that I will collect information from you all other than uh, if you want to share anything in the Q&A section. But think about whether or not you are taking any prescription medications. And when I say prescription medication, uh, I'm thinking as medications that somebody uh, prescribed to you, a physician, a nurse practitioner, um, physician assistant, Anybody that prescribed your medication, you, you uh, had that prescription sent to a pharmacy and you uh, picked it up and are currently taking it. It could be something that was prescribed for just a few days, um, but it could be something that you are supposed to take for a very long time. And now I will also ask you to think whether there's anything that you are currently taking that you can go to uh, a pharmacy, even a grocery store and their, their pharmacy and buy over the counter. Um, over the counter medications, again, are the ones that you don't necessarily need a prescription for. You can just go and, and decide to, that you want to, to take it for whatever the reason that is. And then the last one I am going to ask you is whether or not you are taking any vitamins and supplements. We know that um, lots of vitamins and supplements are sold. Uh, again, they are available over the counter. Uh, some of them are pres uh, prescribed as well. Uh, but anybody that wants to uh, go to, um, to the pharmacy, they can, they can uh, get multivitamins, they can get supplements. We see lots of advertisements on TV for this that you know, help us as we age. Um, and they are important to consider in the context of medication use and aging. And I'll get to it some more in the, in the presentation. In addition to all the advertisements we see for, for medications, either prescription or over the counter, uh, you might see in the news headlines like this one, new drugs found to cause side effects years after approval. And this is not uncommon. There are um, lots of studies that are done after a medication uh, is approved by the Food and Drug Administration to be used by um, populations in general in the United States. And it takes time until uh, some adverse events related, adverse effects related to, to those medications are uh, being able to, to uh, be noticeable and captured. And there are these types of um, um, warnings that are being issued. 
um, there are new medications that come to the market every single year. Uh, and at the time they are approved by the FDA, we don't know everything about those medications. So again, this is related to the, the previous uh, headlines that I, I started with. Um, and I brought Ozempic because this seemed to be a very on-trend um, medication that now is is uh, it's being used by uh, more and more people. There are uh, clear uh, benefits of using these medications for weight loss. Um, again, originally, this medication was approved in the context of patients that have uh, diabetes, but is more and more used by patients without diabetes. And we don't know um, all of the um, outcomes that might be associated with use uh, of Ozempic. We might know the, the benefits uh, of using Ozempic, but we don't fully understand the um, unwanted uh, effects that might exist with Ozempic, especially when you use it for long term. And related to um, the, the fact that I asked you to think about uh, common over-the-counter medications, um, this, this is a headline from not uh, too, too long ago, um, 2016, so maybe it is long, but it's, it still stays valid. Uh, common over-the-counter drugs being related to um, health outcomes that are undesirable. This one is particularly pointing out to outcomes that are uh, hurting um, our brain health. And, uh, and again, this comes because of my the focus of my research. So lots of things when, uh, when it comes to medications. When we start taking a medication, there is a reason. Um, we have... Um, an indication to, to think about taking that medication. And we have an assumption that that medication or vitamin or supplement will help us. However, we need to also think about possi the possibility of effects that are not something that we desire for. And since the topic of today's talk is on medications and aging, um, I wanted to, to point out a few things um, about older adults and the use of medications. And older adults in general are more susceptible to um, unwanted effects from any medications that being used. And when I say medications, I just want to clarify that I'm not talking only about um, prescription medications. I am talking in general. And there are um, Biological reasons uh, why older adults are more susceptible. Some of them have to do with age. Um, a lot of the medications uh, are cleared by our body through um, the kidney or the liver. And as we get older, um, our organs also get older. And so our kidney in their in our 50s, 60s, 70s are not the same uh, as our kidney in our 20s or our liver in our 20s. And so by with with age, kidney and liver have a decrease in their function and that affects uh, our body's ability to clear drugs. Relative to um, and related to brain health, um, our brain and our uh, central nervous system is being protected by um, medication for um, is being protected uh, from experiencing um, unwanted effects by uh, the blood brain barrier. This is a, a barrier that uh, it kind of limits what gets to our central ner nervous system. As we age, um, that barrier is not as tight as it is in younger people, and that allows medications to get to our brain. So in, in just by reaching to the brain, there is a chance that they will affect our brain um, more um, than in, in uh, uh, younger ages. And our brain itself becomes more sensitive to the effects of medication. So there are all of these um, changes that happen with aging that make us more susceptible to the effects of medications. And again, here I'm pointing out to effects that we don't want, not the ones that we are seeking. 
In addition to these biological changes, um, Older adults are more at risk for experiencing what we call polypharmacy. And polypharmacy is defined as the use of multiple medications by one person. And typically, polypharmacy is defined as the use of five or more medications. And while it's not always clear whether only prescription medications are counted, I can tell you that more and more evidence points towards uh, needing to consider uh, not only prescription medications, but also over-the-counter medications, vitamins, and supplements when deciding whether somebody uh, suffers from polypharmacy. And the important um, and why is important to think about number of medication is because the more medication one uses, the greater the chances that uh, at least one will cause some problems down the road. Um, and we would call those medications that are likely to cause problems potentially inappropriate. And this, this figure here is just trying to show you, this is a, a study that has been published a while ago, but they looked at all of the, the older adults in the, in the United States, and they looked to see whether they are using um, any medications. And um, in, in, in the study they did, almost 90% of the population was using at least one medication. You see that no drugs, which is that bright yellow, uh, is only 11.6% um, of the population in the study. And importantly, anybody that used at least one medication, um, among those, 40% had at least one medication that was potentially inappropriate. And by again, by potentially inappropriate, it means they, they um, bring some potential risks when medications are being used. Another uh, issue we see that is related um, both to polypharmacy and um, kind of the, the disease burden, the fact that older adults have more um, more health conditions is what we describe um, with, with something like this. You have a medication being prescribed. Um, you might experience a side effect of um, from that medication, but that side effect might not be necessarily recognized as related to the medication. It just recognized as a new condition for which the patient might seek a, a medical attention. And if that um, side effect is not recognized as such, maybe a new medication is being prescribed to address that side effect that is not recognized as um, a side effect. Um, the new medication that is being prescribed can um, itself have uh, additional side effects. And you can imagine how this can go on and on uh, forever. Uh, and it, it becomes a vicious circle. Um, I like this, this comic because it really captures um, what I just said. And I will uh, stop for a second so you can uh, read the, the caption of, of this uh, figure. So it really describes what we call a prescribing cascade. One medication being uh, prescribed to treat the side effects of another medication, leading to new side effects, and then again, another medication being prescribed, and so on and so forth. So prescribing cascades are... Uh, an important issue to be aware of um, when, when taking medications. And you want to, to avoid them as much as you can, because otherwise it, it will be hard to untangle uh, what came first and what is needed versus what is not necessary. So I, I presented lots of things that um, are things to be aware of and, and consider. And you might ask yourself, is there anything that I can personally do to prevent all of these problems from occurring? 
And I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, and it, it's not easy. I'm not saying that it's easy, but um, it is important to learn how to advocate for yourself or for those that you care for and ask questions. And again, this is a, a topic on medications. Ask questions about the medications that you are taking or those you care for are taking. Um, learn uh, safe medication practices, and I'll cover some recommendations as well. And then always think in terms of balancing risks and benefits. Anything that uh, is medication, either prescription, over-the-counter, vitamin supplements, um, carry risks, not just potential benefits. And while something might be beneficial for one person at one point in time, the same medication might have a different risk benefit profile in another patient. So it's not just about the medications, it's the medication in the context of the patient. So let's talk a little bit of the, about things that one can do when um, their doctor recommends starting a new medication. What are some questions that uh, one might might want to ask? Uh, uh, one question that might always come up uh, in the conversation is whether or not the medication can be taken or should be taken with or without food. Some medications one have to take on an empty stomach. Others, um, you have to, to take them after you had your meal. Uh, some, you have to avoid taking with certain medication, certain, certain foods. Um, so food is an important component of the conversation. When is the best time of the day to take my medication is an important consideration for, for discussion. Uh, some have to be taken in the morning. Others are better to be taken right before bedtime. Um, for instance, a medication that is making somebody sleepy, it's causing sleepiness, um, you might want to uh, take it right before going to bed. It might actually help with, with sleeping. You don't want to take it in the morning or in the middle of the day, especially if you have plans for, for that day. So knowing when is the best time of the day uh, to take the medication is important to ask. Is it safe to, to crush or split the tablets or if it's a capsule to open the capsule? Some are okay, but not everything is um, allowed to, to, to be split or crushed or um, you name it in terms of, of taking it. So those are questions to, to ask. Um, and while you might ask your, uh, your doctor, they might or might not, not know depending on what the pharmacy has available for, for um, your prescription. Um, you can ask the pharmacist as well. What side effects are most common with this medication? And every medication um, will be, and when you pick it up from the pharmacy, they will likely pro provide you with information. And that information would have a long list of potential side effects. Um, I don't know. Uh, some people might really read carefully those, but not everybody does. Uh, so asking and having a conversation with the doctor that's prescribing the medication is important because they can also tell you what side effects are more common for a patient that looks like you. Um, studies that uh, provide a description of side effects are done in specific populations. So being able to understand where those side effects are more common is important. Um, as applicable to, to you or those that you care for. What should I do if I forget to take uh, a dose? Should I just skip the dose or is it okay for me to, to take it um, the next time I'm, I'm supposed to double the dose next time I'm taking it? Again, those are things that are important to know upfront because sometimes we do forget to take our medication um, and it's important to know what to do in, in those types of situations. And 
In the context of polypharmacy and even prescribing cascade, it's important to know whether the new medication can be taken with other medications that you are taking at that time. Um, is it okay to take them in the same day versus is it okay to take together in the morning? Do I have to space out my, my medications? Um, you might be, have to uh, put at least a four hour uh, window between, let's say, um, uh, levothyroxine, which is uh, treating um, uh, your thyroid problems. And uh, if you have to take uh, something that has calcium in it. So those would be uh, examples of uh, having to, they are okay to be taken together uh, in a day, but not at the same time. So you have to space them, them out between um, taking them. And since I mentioned other medication, uh, one thing I would like for you to think about is uh, if you are taking more, if you are taking anything and you are taking more than one, do you know if I were to talk to you face to face and, and um, ask you about the medications you are taking, would you be able to give me all the relevant information about the medications you are taking? And I will, um, I will uh, say that is very important because we we often uh, don't want to rely on our memory um, the more complex the medication regimens uh, are the the harder to keep up with all the details is so keeping an updated medication list is another advice i will uh, give you all um, and you can uh, think and and can find your own reason to motivate you to to maintain um, a medication list it really helps you to provide uh, accurate information to anybody that you are seeking uh, medical advice from, and I'm talking uh, physicians and other medical professionals. Um, you might ask yourself, don't they know from my medical record? Um, if you are like me and you you um, you seek all your medical care um, as part of UK healthcare, you might say, "Well, it's in my in my medical record." Um, but the the list they have might different from might differ from uh, what you are actually taking, and it might be that they only see the prescription medications, um, and you they have no information on whether you are taking any um, over the counter medications, any vitamins, any supplements. Um, when I, for instance, when I go and see my my uh, my doctor, they always asking me uh, ask me uh, about the medications I'm taking. But sometimes there isn't enough time to uh, to discuss those things. Um, so if they ask the question, um, having a list helps facilitate the conversation, and it helps you to to remember all the important details. In addition, if you are seeing um, Prof medical professionals that are at various uh, places, those places might not necessarily talk to one another. And when I say talk to one another, um, I mean uh, a physician or a, a medical professional from one office might not be able to see everything um, that is captured in the medical record at the other office. So it's important for you to be um, the one that is sharing the information and, and keeping everyone on the same page. So what kind of information would this list uh, contain? Um, here's an example of a list uh, from, from a, um, a patient uh, we, we had in one of the, the studies that we conducted. And you see here, this is the a list of medications they were taking. It includes the um, drug names and um, the, the top here are prescription. Uh, the other two are medications and, and uh, some supplements that are available without prescription. Uh, this is another example um, from another participant uh, that was um, 
keeping a very detailed uh, table with everything that they were taking, including the reason for taking it, the dose, when they started, who prescribed that medication, um, whether or not they stopped taking it, and if they did stop, uh, what was the reason, um, and, and some additional notes about that medication. So think about these two options and, and uh, just like, you know, um, would you choose option one or would you choose option two? And um, the reasons might be there um, and option one might be easier to, to put together. It's just a list of names. Uh, option two takes some time to develop, at least uh, if you, when you start, um, you have to update on a regular basis. Uh, but from a medical standpoint and from providing somebody with a clear picture of what you are taking, the reasons you are taking, and if you stop taking uh, something, the reasons behind stopping, um, those, I would say, option two is more of an ideal um, a version of how one should maintain a, a medication list. Uh, in today's day and age, lots of people have access to computers, um, and and so uh, that list can be... Um, on in, in on a on a computer and then you might print uh, something new every time you you update it um, I also wanted to show you how you can get the information from uh, the label um, of the the medication so this is an example of how a label <clears throat> for a prescription medication, um, would look and you can see here information on the pharmacy that um, uh, dispense that medication, uh, who prescribed the medication, um, you even have uh, the prescription number, the name uh, and the personal information of the, the patient, how to take the, uh, the medication and then uh, exactly what the medication is. Um, what is the, the name, the quantity that was dispensed, how many uh, refills are remaining for, for that patient, um, which means after that, the patient will have to see their, their physician, their prescriber uh, to, to get a, a new refill issue um, and so on and so forth. So you can, uh, I, I hope you can picture how this information that, he, that is here could then uh, pro, uh, be included in that table that lists all the details on every medication that somebody is taking. Over-the-counter medications will not have that same label that is personalized with the patient information, but there, would, there will still be um, information that can be uh, taken um, on the either on a bottle or on the packaging for, for that over-the-counter medication. Um, you will have information on what is included in that, uh, in that medication, so the active ingredient. Uh, you will have information on how to take that medication and what you will put in the, in the table is how you are actually taking the medication, not something that you just copy, uh, from here, but rather how you are taking that medication and so on and so forth. Um, another thing that uh, you might want to ask is um, for any other recommendations about taking this medication. Anything that you need to know before starting to take that medication on a regular basis. And I may mention some about um, foods and taking it with foods, um, about other prescription medications, but uh, I wanted to uh, bring up uh, all of these in the context of what we call drug interactions. There are medications that interact with food um, and, and drinks, including alcohol, but not only alcohol. Uh, one that is uh, Quite uh, important to consider is, for instance, uh, grapefruit juice. Grapefruit juice interacts with lots of medications. 
Um, and you, you need to know whether um, those medications, um, you have to avoid uh, drinking any grapefruit juice if you are taking those medications. Uh, food, for instance, um, green leaves um, and, and some vegetables ha have a high content of, of vitamin K, which is important. However, some medications, for instance, uh, blood thin, some blood thinners will interact with, with, um, with those and uh, high doses of vitamin K will impact um, the, the results you are getting from your blood thinners. Um, and I already mentioned other prescription medications and non-prescription medications that can um, interact with, with one another. Um, drugs can interact with other um, health conditions that the, the patient has. For instance, um, you know, if you have high blood pressure, you, su you su should stay away from some of the nasal decongestants. We are entering, um, you know, the season where there will be lots of viral respiratory, uh, viral infections, uh, nasal decongestion um, are things you can go and buy over the counter, ca counter, and you have to be careful with whether um, those might uh, increase uh, or or get your blood pressure even higher than than it is. So you you have to be uh, considerate of that of those. A few recommendations for safe medication practices. Um, this this might sound uh, you know quite common sense, um, but unfortunately um, we need to to kind of repeat all of this um, over and over again to make sure everybody is uh, aware of of these practices. Um, if you take a medication by prescription, then you should take it as prescribed by your doctor um, or other medical professional that prescribed the medication. They really prescribe it for the condition you are suffering from um, and for, uh, you know, accounting, uh, granted that you have those conversations about food and other medications. So they will um, uh, account for, for all of those um, as the individual patient level. If you are taking something that's over the counter, then make sure you are checking the label and taking it under those parameters that are described on the label. Don't take it the way maybe your friend is taking it or uh, somebody else that you know um, is recommending. If you have your medications either prescribed or um, you know you 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 know that you you need them and you buy them over the counter, uh, make sure that you are not sharing them with somebody else that might live in the same household. Um, every person should have their own medications and and there shouldn't be sharing, especially and this is um, quite important for prescription medications. Make sure you store your medications correctly, right? If, if it uh, requires you to uh, store the medications in the uh, fridge at lower temperature uh, after you open the, the, the bottle or after the suspension is being made by the, the pharmacy, then make sure you store the medication in the fridge. Um, if it requires, um, you know, to be stored in, in dry and cool conditions, you can store it like te uh, room temperature, but make sure it's not maybe in the, in the sunlight. Um, and, and if the medication is something that is intended for you and you only, and it poses some risks for others that, um, have not had it prescribed, then make sure that that medication is out of reach for others that might live in the same uh, household. If you have medication that is, um, in the, in the house, you don't need it anymore. Um, you, you can dispense uh, and dispose of, of that medication safely. Uh, there are pharmacies around town. I know uh, for a fact that the uh, pharmacy at the Kentucky Clinic um, 
has these receptacles that uh, you can turn uh, your unused medication and it's being disposed safely. So again, make sure that you don't uh, keep medications uh, longer than you, you need them or maybe past the expiration day. And you should not just throw them in the garbage or uh, dump them uh, down the drain um, because those can affect our environment that we all live into uh, and we want to make uh, keep it safe. And then I will end with, with some things that um, we learned through the studies we, we've done here at the University of Kentucky, um, where we, we put a lot of focus on the balancing of risks and benefits uh, through a, a few studies that we conducted here in the community. Um, and we used, really used these quick safety tips um, with, with our participants. Um, we recommended that they all keep a, a list, uh, track their medications, stick with one pharmacy, um, or getting even better, getting to know the pharmacist that um, is working in the pharmacy they, they go to. Um, Check with the prescription if you pick it up from uh, when you pick it up from the the pharmacy to make sure it's really what um, was prescribed to you. Um, never start a new medication, especially if it's something that can cause uh, side effects. Um, when you are alone, make sure you have somebody nearby. Look after uh, after you start the medication. Make sure you don't experience some new symptoms that you 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 didn't have before. Um, and every time you have something new, make sure you, you ask for a medication review um, and ask whether everything, every time you see a, your, your doctor, you go to the pharmacy, ask whether you have to take everything that you are currently taking or whether uh, something can be stopped. Um, and again, uh, a few ideas, and you, you will be receiving this, this slide um, of questions for the doctor um, and or the pharmacist when following up on, on medications. And uh, this is what we learned from um, a recent study we, we did, uh, where we enrolled participants from um, the community around Lexington, um, and we uh, were asking everyone to tell us uh, in detail about the medications they, they were taking. And what you see in this figure um, is that among 90 participants in our study uh, and the medications that they were taking, our team that comprised of a physician and the pharmacist made recommendations um, 600, over 600 recommendations about those medications. Um, and you can see on the, on the top, um, the, the medications were all over, uh, the, the spectrum of, uh, recommended medications from some for hypertension or high cholesterol for, to some that were treating, um, um, you know, too much acid, uh, and acid reflux or pain. And among those 602 uh, recommendations that were made, um, about a third were uh, related to those adjustments. So um, the patients were taking either too much or too little of the medication to, to get the, the right risk-benefit balance. Uh, about a third of those medica uh, uh, those recommendations um, were related to switching the medication from something that might have more risks for that patient to something that would still benefit them, but will have uh, fewer risks. So the risk-benefit balance was more in favor of benefits. Um, some recommendations were related to monitoring of the, the treatment. Um, some were related to a non-pharmacological, uh, that means any recommendations uh, for um, any disease management that does not involve uh, medications. Some of them, uh, you see here on the slide, 8% were about stopping a medication that was deemed unnecessary for, for that patient. And uh, roughly uh, a similar percent, 7%, was about uh, something that the patient needed, 
but was not currently on their medication list. So initiation of a new medication. Um, and so I wanted to show you this slide just to give you a, a sense of how complex this uh, conversation can be. Um, and the fact that it's not a one size fits all approach, um, that it should be very individualized to um, every uh, patient and not just a patient and it's a one and done, but rather something that should be done um, as time passes because things change from year to year, sometimes from month to month. And so all of these uh, conversations should be um, having them um, continuously. And this is kind of what our approach in all of the studies we've done um, was to uh, approach the recommendations for medications from this risk benefit balance approach, uh, keeping in a pa the patient um, as the, the center of the, the attention and, and looking at um, what they were taking, what they were needing and, and finding that sweet spot where um, the, the, risk benefit uh, balance was always uh, you know more towards uh, benefits rather than rather than than risks and this is all um i had uh, we should have some time for um for some questions uh, and i would be happy to answer any questions you might have i don't see anything in the Thank chat you, Dr. If you guys have any questions, please type them in the chat. You're also welcome to unmute yourself and ask your question directly. I love all of the practical advice you just gave us. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to so summarize all of the science and the things we've learned. Um, and so hopefully those will, will provide some guidance. And I think there is a question. Um, okay. Oh, not a question. Uh, you are most <laughs> welcome. <laughs> any questions out there? And um, feel free to, to share my email address. I mean, anybody can find uh, my email address just by searching for my name uh, on the UK's website um, or even in, in Google, putting my name in UK. Um, I would be happy to, to follow up with uh, any questions uh, that will be addressed to me directly by, by email. That would not be a problem.